Hello everyone, and welcome to week 11 of uh, 1619 and the making of the Americas. Uh, I'm here with my colleague and friend, Dr. Michelle Crestfield. Hello. And we are going to start off uh, this week um, with a, just a conversation between the two of us on Kiesi Lehman's um, piece on Jesse Jackson. And I should say, actually, this is a second take because these papers just all flew away. So we're uh, in real time here trying to work with this new way of, uh, of engaging uh, with you and with the, with the class. So because this is a short piece um, and it's so powerful and it lends itself to kind of just reading over the actual words and reading aloud, we thought what we would do is start with um, actually reading. I'm going to read the first half, Michelle's going to read the second half, and then we're just going to go for a walk and chat about it a bit and see where that takes us. So, let me begin. My older sister, Ray, makes me write 500 words every night before I go to bed. Tonight, I want to write 5 million because of this speech by Jesse Jackson, a black man with big, beautiful eyeballs. While we were working on the Barnett House tonight, Ray kept saying that Jesse's speech was going to do for us what Ronald Reagan's speech did for white folks at the Neshoba County Fair four years ago. Ronald Reagan came to the fair and said some words about states' rights. Those words made a lot of white folks at the fair happier than Christmas Eve. Those words made Ray, Mama, Granny, and our whole church so scared we had to leave. When we got in the van, Ray told me that Ronald Reagan came to Mississippi to offer white folks an all-you-can-eat buffet of black suffering. I asked Ray if white folks left full. She sucked her teeth. Daphinus, who worked on the house with us this summer, stayed to watch the speech too. He's from Oaxaca, Mexico, and his grandmother was just stolen by police and sent back to Oaxaca. I don't know if Ray and Daphinas go together, but they look at each other's hands like they do. All of us watched Jesse Jackson say the names of people I never heard at school. He talked about Goodman, Cheney, and Schwerner. He talked about Fannie Lou Hamer, Martin King, and Rabbi Abraham Heschel. He talked about Hispanic Americans, Arab Americans, African Americans. He talked about lesbian and gay Americans having something called equal protection under the law. He talked about, about powerful coalitions made of rainbows. When we walked out of the Barnett house, a house we were building in a white neighborhood where none of us would be able to live, I watched Aphenis and Ray hug for eight seconds. On the way home, I asked Ray why she seemed so sad. Rainbows, they're pretty, but they ain't real, she said. Only thing real down here is suffering and work and love. I told Ray that I liked her more than Apple now and later. But if believing in rainbows makes us love better, then rainbows can be just as real as work and love. And if we really believed, we might be able to bring Daphinus' granny back. And one day, instead of building houses for white folks in neighborhoods we could never even visit if we weren't working there, we could maybe build beautiful houses with gardens where all of our grannies could sit on porches and safely tell lies that sound true. I never seen a black and brown rainbow, Red said, but I'll always believe in us. I'll be sad when you go to college, I told her, but mostly I'll be fine because I can't stop believing that rainbows are real and the land and the black and brown folks under the rainbows we will one day be free. Thank you. Okay, why don't we go for a walk and have a talk about it. Awesome. Okay, let's see if these stay without blowing away again, good. Can I give the camera to you for a sure. second? Thank you. This is Dr. Monroe as he's <laughs> navigating mobile teaching. That's right. <laughs> okay, shall we? We shall. I have very short arms, but I'm gonna put it on you. <laughs> so, where do we, we don't have any kind of agenda here. We just decided to meet, have a coffee, uh, and we just yes. decided at this moment to read the piece and, and walk together. So, um, do you want to start? Yeah. What are your first thoughts? I guess for me, I'm thinking about Jesse Jackson, and mm -hmm. I'm thinking about his role in kind of American historiography. I think that if you are in certain circles, you really know who he is. Uh -huh. But I think that he is a figure that might not have made it to the mainstream of American 
history in some in some ways. Like I yeah. think he's really important in black politics. Yeah. Um, and so I guess I'm wondering about what you think about the way he's positioned as like the the kind of architect or author of this really big turning point and blackness but also too you could read that like he's, he's really important as a candidate in the democratic party yeah. uh in the 80s and yeah. so how do you make sense of him um as as a kind of architect of this turning point for understandings of blackness and mobility but also in kind of democratic principles yeah wow so many things i mean for me i feel like i mean it's also interesting because in the piece too of course it reminds us of someone i mean i feel like to me jackson's pretty well known, but obviously Ronald Reagan is more well known. It's the, it's his era. Um, and so I feel like this is a revisiting of Reagan as well. And in terms of historiography, as you say, it also is really in keeping with a kind of bigger rethinking about the 80s that, that I think is going on. With Reagan, we needed maybe to um, to step away a little bit from the Cold, the Cold War. He won the Cold War, all this Reagan triumphalism. Um, which was, of course, contested at every moment at the right. time, but is, I think, now up for a kind of larger historiographical sort of rethinking and, and criticism. Um, and and so, so the Jesse Jackson story in the 80s, to me, is, is kind of part of that. Mm -hmm. um, and as you say, it's, it's an important moment. In, of course, it's an important moment um, and whole period in black politics when someone like Jackson came as close as he did right. to the Democratic nomination and then therefore as close as he did to the presidency, not only as an African-American figure, but also as uh, someone whose platform was as radical as it was in many ways. Yeah. Yeah, so that has me thinking about um, the Rainbow Coalition, right? And so the way in which, you know, at a time when, you know, you're, you're at, um, you know, the, the midst of an AIDS epidemic, you're in the midst of um, kind of widespread poverty, white flight from urban ghettos, where he envisioned this kind of coalition of people coming together and really was, you know, bold enough in a moment where you don't have a lot of people speaking up for, you know, these various groups that they should come together and that there was a political destiny in that uniting. Um, and so, I guess my cynical question is like, why is that not a kind of clarion cry of the right? <laughs> Um, but also, too, what do you make of it happening in this moment? Well, I mean, I kind of feel like that's one of the things that's so powerful about the Rainbow Coalition idea is that Jackson sort of pulls together in alliance all of the targets of the Reagan administration. I mean, and that's what's so great about the Lehman piece is it with such incredible economy brings all of that together, plus the sort of the way that the piece creates kind of like sense of that possibility in that moment mm -hmm. that we know has passed, you know? And we know that, of course, Reagan got a second term, that, you know, not only did Jackson not get the nomination, but um, Reagan, of course, continued on, and then George H.W. Bush after him, this was the Republican right. era, um, which meant, of course, silence in the face of the AIDS epidemic um, and everything that meant the ongoing, I mean, just think about the, just think about that alone, let yeah. alone all of the other things. Um, that that took place. All of the other sort of targets of that administration, and and Jackson, you know, his his candidacy was was a way of speaking to all of those together. It's it's uh, it's remarkable, really. I mean, in one way, sort of, it's it's tragic that it didn't go get further than it did, mm -hmm. but it's also like remarkable that it happened to the extent that it did within U.S. politics. I feel like. Yeah, I think that that's a, a, a really important point in terms of thinking about, yeah, the, the there's a way I think you can look at it and it's coming from this very idealistic standpoint, but it's also a really brilliant um, kind of uh, strategic move as well. And it re kind of reminds me of like this new envision, like New Deal coalition. Yeah. Um, you know, if you think about like this, this kind of contingent of people, especially, you know, coming out of queer rights, women's reproductive rights of the 70s and 60s, that you have this kind of articulation being made at the kind of tail end of this like big groundswell and like kind of progressive um, progress that seems to be under threat with Reagan, right? And so the kind of holding on to the principles of that um, in Jackson, I think, is really, really interesting. Definitely. Um, and I, I can take a turn holding the camera if yeah. you want. Thanks. Yeah, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so 
I was just gonna say that uh, yes to all of that, definitely. Um, and, and as well, not only does the Layman piece show how the Jackson Coalition, you know, was something larger than, larger than the New Deal Coalition, and that it also, um, you know, the New Deal Coalition in its sort of, I guess, quasi-official way, um, you know, w w what did it have to say about homophobia? Uh -huh. You know, um, yeah. and so and so. Therefore, what were the ways in which it actually just that it re-entrenched a kind of heteronormativity, mm -hmm. um, while it was oppositional in different ways as well. Um, of course, legislatively, the ways that the that the New Deal coalition in Congress obviously was in many ways an anti-black coalition with the Southern segregationist wing playing such a role, and so on. So it's also interesting just thinking about what you're saying in terms of 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 the relationship of the um, Rainbow Coalition to the New Deal yeah. era. Um, what gets left out earlier and, and the ways in which that's really brought to the fore um, in, in the 80s. Um, it also makes me think like, the, if you th when I think of the 80s, I mean, I think of many fun things also because uh, I can remember them. Um, <laughs> but uh, I also feel like there's the kind of fun pop culture of all the different kinds. But I think politically it's like, mostly remembered, or what would you say to this? Would you say that the, maybe I'll just ask this as a question and see what you say first. How would you characterize the 80s politically in the US? I feel like it was conservative. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> and why do you say that? Um, I think because you see a lot of retrenchment in terms of like, so when I talked about those political ideals, you see a lot of the retrenchment there. Like you get like this really um, m a militant men's rights movement that's emerging in the 80s. Uh -huh. You get the kind of rollback, particularly the, the kind of health um, kind of catastrophe that is the, the epidemic that is AIDS and like the ways in which um, queer communities and also queer communities of color and particularly because of the kind of intersections of racism and um, homophobia are really leaving these communities to suffer and so it really seems like you had this kind of you know age of like ascendancy like not that the 60s and 70s were necessarily um, you know always joyous because right they're, they're the site of a lot of contestation but that you you felt by the end of that period that you really achieved something and I think that the 80s showed that actually you know people might have gotten legal rights or some types of provisions but that never changed hearts and minds in terms of thinking about the yeah. equality of citizenship yeah and like what those bigger trappings were yeah exactly and also the way that it's amazing how again with so few words I mean think how long it only took us to read the whole piece yeah. right yeah. it does so much yeah and the way of course through um reagan's neshoba county speech which was i think the first that was i think his first speech in the um uh as as candidate for uh the election in the election of 1980 i think okay um yeah, yeah, yeah. and and of course that he did that to, to do a state's rights speech in the very county where uh goodwin schwerner and cheney were murdered um by the most you know reactionary forces of white supremacy um of course signaled so much and and that that sort of that term of of layman uses the uh an all-you-can-eat buffet of black suffering for yeah. white people like it's so it's so it speaks to the excess of the 80s too like yes. you're like i totally agree it's like yeah. a conservative era it's also an era of excess i feel yes, like in like lots of ways mass consumption like the, the rise of the yuppie like all of these um kinds of trappings of and particularly right that consumption is racialized in a particular way with yeah. like um like about you know it's the age of dynasty yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> the yeah. with the big hair yeah um yeah so i think i think that that's absolutely right and in the in the ways in which you know that what i thought was interesting the parallels between the way that like layman is signaling this kind of move in his writing but also the way in which where people choose to speak give speeches like the political work the dog whistling of that mm -hmm. when you don't even have to make the a kind of overt statement right which is yeah. the power of yeah. the 80s and like what reagan is doing yeah absolutely um, oh my goodness that's so right and the way that that sets the terms for trump actually yes i was thinking it's very a la trump yeah um in that and especially right the kickoff you know recently about him wanting to speak in oklahoma uh -huh, which exactly is the of these kind of mass um, you know, terrorism against black Americans um, Absolutely. in the you know, 19th century. Exactly. Um, so one of the questions I had, so when I read about this, I think I was thinking about some, com some conversations that colleagues, uh, you and I have been having about the political projects 
the political work of black intellectual projects, right? Uh -huh. And so one of the things that I thought was really great about the end, it leaves on this note of like, I'll always believe in us. Yeah. And like the hopefulness of living in a country that never really kind of lives up to its ideals of equality. Yeah. And so one of the things that the 1619 debate has been criticized about is its kind of fidelity to truth and or accuracy or, or, or balanced reporting in some way. And so I was kind of wondering, thinking about this piece, how are you reading, how, does this piece help make you reread 1619 in a different way? Or do you see this as a moment of really thinking through, like this, this piece is not just about the history, but it's about this way of trying to center black people in the history of the United States. You know? Yeah, yeah, that's so, that's so, thank you. That's really perfect for what we're doing in the class this week in particular, because this is the week where we're looking at scholarly critique and, and sort of public debate that is circulated around the 1619 project. So, um, so this is obviously very apt. Um, I think that um, that the, the, this week's reading does that. Um, and it also, how to put this, it, um, it, it shows that kind of hopefulness um, and in, in, in doing that. And then it also speaks to a tradition that we can, you know, that in this piece kind of goes back more or less to the 60s. But of course, we can draw back all the way, you know, through traditions of black intellectual production, uh, obviously different kinds of activism and resistances of various kinds, spontaneous, organized, and in between. So I feel like, you know, just in this little sort of, I don't know, it's not really a snapshot, but in this little piece of writing on this, on this moment, it, it does all of those things. And at the same time, it also connects to what we were talking about last week in the class with the international dimensions um, of uh, white supremacy and the, international, the internationalism of anti-racism as well. Mm -hmm. That, that to, to just answer your question a little bit more, like if you, if you think about US history with African Americans at the center, then that also gives us a kind of another way of thinking about transnational U.S. history, mm -hmm. very much so, I think. Yeah. Um, so, with the, so with the Jackson candidacy then, um, you know, his um, uh, foreign policy advisor, Jack O'Dell, um, who you know I speak to you about often because he such an, was such an important mentor of mine, um, totally brought that sensibility to the, to the Jackson campaign as well. And then we also see that in the Lehman piece with um, the references to Mexico right, uh, yeah. and to, um, uh, to immigration, to the stolenness of a, a person mentioned, yeah. um, also gives us uh, um, a way of thinking about the international dimensions of this um, as well. But I'm also really curious, how would you, how would you put this reading that we just read into a kind of context of thinking about black history or black people at the center of the United States or US history? Yes, I'm really thinking about, I find myself as I was reading all of the pieces really coming back to um, Cynthia Hartman's Way We're Lives uh, that we've been thinking about and thinking about the ways in which black people are not in the archive, the traditional archive in the ways in which you can find others. Yeah. And then the projects that are left to scholars who want to uncover aspects of those lives but are don't have the kind of things that would count as evidence yeah that would count as kind of objectively gathered yeah. facts that yeah. you can then compose together to create a narrative yeah and then what what when you lack that what are you left with and i think that 1619 for all of its um you know criticisms against it i think it is a project that's born out of this knowledge acknowledgement that black peoples have not been centered around history they've actually actually been actively obscured mm -hmm. and so i think that's really important um in that regard and i but i think and i hope that students think about this how do you balance a political project which is this is very much but with a, a kind of vigorous intellectual project and, and when i say this i'm not meaning to suggest that 1619 isn't vigorous scholarship mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but but what are the how do you keep those two nodes 
um, together and what are your fidelities as you work through that? I think that those are you know, questions that I hope that the students are thinking about and asking as they're reading the work or yeah. as, as they have read the work. Yeah, yeah. And great point too about the archival traces, lack thereof, and records. I mean, with the Jackson um, uh, campaign, with the Rainbow Coalition, um, one thing I do know, actually kind of interestingly on the point of archives, is that as we speak, um, the Jack O'Dell papers are being uh, sent and processed. They're going to be in two locations in New York City, so students might be interested in this, that one of the um, sort of archival centers to learn more about the Rainbow Coalition uh, is going to be through these papers of Jack O'Dell, one of um, uh, the Reverend Jackson's advisors um, at the Schomburg Library and at the Tamamet Library. They're going to be in sort of these two spaces, as far as I know. Um, so it's like that history is 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 at this moment being sort of cataloged. Um, and that's not, um, you know, that's taking the work of some uh, volunteer efforts as well. Yeah. Like this isn't like, as opposed to say the Reagan papers where you know there's a lot of money behind making sure right. that the library is there and the things are there um, uh, to, for researchers to look at. Um, even something as official as the, as the Jesse Jackson campaign, someone so important um, that, that even there, um, there isn't the kind of um, necessarily financial uh, support um, that there might be for for others. So, yeah. Yeah, and I think too, right? If you think about when 1619 drops, right, in the midst of um, you know, kind of a string of executions at the hand of the police of, of, of black people, we have you know the Black Lives Matter movement, and that that's coming on this kind of you know, this moment of, or after kind of Obama's presidency where many people thought that like, you know, well, with the, the ascension of this president, America's core racial issues have been solved. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. that the 1619 Project, one of the great things that it does, in addition to recovering the past, is that it has a really great thorough line about connecting those things to the present. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, thinking through that work as well and thinking about the kind of legacy and the ongoing um, consequences of some of these earlier ideas early very early ideas about race in america indeed yeah. yeah well i think maybe does that seem like a place that's pretty well said that seems a kind of a perfect place to yeah let it sit okay well thank you for this conversation thank you it's wonderful bye class <laughs> see you later <laughs>